What was for you when you when you had your own band and you were playing and recording? Um, was the dream come true then? Well, interesting. Um, what happens? I think it depends on how what your first recording experience is like. Um, my first record deal and my first recording experience weren't it wasn't a very pleasant experience. And uh, you think? I mean, I was, I was I was excited. I mean, we'd been signed by the biggest producer in the world at the time, Rick Rubin. And of course, I was excited that like I finally had a a jumping off point, you know. And uh, but the recording of the record was miserable, and and uh, so I know people love that record, and and uh, so I and I play a lot of music off it. Uh, if I but I, it's hard for me to listen to the whole record. What happened then? Well, the the band was at odds. The band had split into two factions, and uh, and Rick Rubin's a very powerful personality as well, and it it just was something I almost like. I just wanted to get get it over with when I was in the middle of that record, like like. Just, just do this, so I, you know, can, I can move on because it wasn't very pleasant, and uh, unfortunately, but uh, some of the musical ideas got got captured, and I'm proud of those moments that I'm proud of. Um, but, but but if you listen to the album, it's for you still hard, because it brings brings back memories that you don't want to be. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, just uh, it's your first album. And it's your first big record deal, blah blah blah, you know, and uh, and it just wasn't the the joy that you'd think it would be, and of course I think we were like like 30, so we weren't kids anymore really either, you know what I mean? So um, yeah, it was it was it was mixed, you know. And then the second album, it was three years later. Total joy. Yeah. How come? Ginger Baker, Googe, you know, like one of the best rhythm sections ever. I wish we had more records with those two guys. And uh, but how come? But how come you did only one then? Because you think it's going to last forever, and that the money's going to tumble in, and we'll be we'll be able to hang out and do that for a long time. And it doesn't. And uh, and then people have to go do what they got to do. Um, if if I if I've been thrifty, see, I'm not, you know I live day to day. I'm really not a, a good businessman, a good business planner. Like I didn't think, okay, I've got Ginger Baker in my band, and I've got to get at least five records out of him in the next two years. And I wasn't rubbing my hands. I was enjoying it and loving it and and jamming and uh, and loving the attention and uh, and loving the music that we made. And so, it was like, oh, oh boy, let's make this last forever, you know. But how come? But but there was. Sorry, Chris, we've got to be on stage in 25 minutes. Can we start wrapping up? Are you? Could you go to the line? 25 minutes? minutes yeah. you, is that enough time for you? Oh no. Uh, I, no, yeah, 25 minutes from now we have to be done. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Oh, okay. okay. Even, even about about 15. Oh, minutes. 10, 15. Okay, yeah, all right, man. I'll, I'll, I can I'll, make I'll it 10. 10. Thanks. Okay, 10. Yeah, I'll do it. Um, It was a long introduction, sorry. So, but now um, uh, I'm flat. Um, the, uh, um, um, but then it took you seven years for the th for the third album. What 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 happened in those seven years? When did when did when did Ginger leave? Um, Ginger left very politely, actually, and uh, we got along really great. You know, um, it was. 1992, and that record came out actually in 93. People say 92. It's dated 92 because the artwork was finished like in December, but it actually came out in February 93. And it, the first single was great, went top five, and a big buzz about the record. And they put us on tour with Alice in Chains, you know, doing pretty large places, but it wasn't, it, wasn't the atmosphere to, for us to stretch out on as a bluesy jam, jam band, almost jazzy kind of jam band at times. 
because uh, that's where our, our, our best moments were when the three of us were stoned and jamming and, and doing crazy shit. Uh, me and Ginger would call it uh, blues acrobatics. And we'd you know, take a riff and play it and then approach it for the next half hour upside down and sideways and, and just work a riff until you find all these different drop spots. And, uh, and it's like juggling. And, and when you're like a rhythm addict like that, you know, like you just love to juggle. And uh, for me, it was like, you know, really playing ping pong with a, with a great player and, and uh, with a great bassist as well. So um, to present that to Alice in Chains crowd, who at the same time were wearing Megadeth t-shirts, and they'll take that atmosphere and put Ginger Baker in it. Yeah. Who who'd already lived through a, a, a creative explosion period in the London in the, in, the, in the 60s, and now he's in America in the early 90s with a, like a, um, a, a with a lot of idiots in the music business, a lot of fucking turds who were still in 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 charge in the 90s in the, in the early 90s before intelligence well, well still hasn't shown up, but. I mean, you know, pre-Nirvana rock world. Even, even though Nirvana was happening at the time, there was still that side of rock that was like, you know, that, the, um, the hand I'm, hand. I'm a fan of some of it, you know, but uh, yeah, this like when, when heavy rock became like championship wrestling, yeah. where it became phony and like this comic the book. Hair, the hair, the hair metal. Yeah, hair, hair and muscles yeah, and, yeah. and and leather straps and and like, you know, just that really really stupid, like you know, like these guys should be digging ditches. They shouldn't be playing guitar. You know, fuck, you know, how are they? How are they on a stage? They're fucking idiots, and uh, you know whatever. But um, that said, Alice in Chains was a great band. You know, Jerry Cantrell is one of the best riff writers ever, and Lane was a sweetheart. But what I had going with Ginger at the time wasn't the best combination with what they were doing. Yeah. And, uh, and we didn't have time to stretch an opening for them as well. And uh, like I said, the, our, our, our power lied in a lot in the improvisation. And uh, you know, having Ginger back there and letting them, letting them get happy and groove. And uh, when you have to stick by a rule book when you're opening for a band, sometimes you have 45 minutes and you got to give them, you know, the eight, seven or eight songs they know, and maybe one or two they don't, whatever. I don't know what, are, what the fucking formula is. But, um, yeah, so that atmosphere for Ginger was overwhelmingly stupid, and he didn't want to put up with it, and I don't blame him. And I remember he called me after the, the Alice in Chains tour got canceled. He said, Chris, I can't do it anymore. And I said, I understand. I don't fucking blame you. I don't fucking blame you. What am I going to tell you? I mean, it's fucking, it's awful out there. You know, I mean, if we had a slot with Neil Young or ZZ Top with a, with a, a band that was a little bit older and, and we could like snuggle up in a, an aesthetic pairing with somebody like that, I think we would have done well. But they tried to sell it as metal and it wasn't. It was it was blues jazz, you yeah. know, and uh, so there were there were really not many compadres to play with at the time, and I didn't want to get into the fabulous Thunderbirds side of things and that and the in the Stevie Ray Vaughan blues world. I never felt comfortable in that world either, you know. I like being pigeonholed in any world, and um, I don't think anyone worth their salt does. That's why Neil Young and David Bowie, they change and they throw curveballs all the time, you know, because they're, you know, they're, they're not stuck in a category, you know. If, if you then look back on, 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 on your third album, because, well, you had in 99, 2001, 2004, it's oh, five years, five years for three albums. How come you had such, well, big output? Decided to. The okay. space between Suffer Bus and the, and the Viper Room record was, what, five years nearly? Um, and then 
1998, I think, was Western Lodge. Then uh, 99 was what? I don't know. Uh, 99 was Western Lodge. Okay. 2001, Deep in the Hole. Yeah. And, uh, Give us Barabbas was uh, 2000, 2004. Yeah, um, I d decided to do it. I think actually Mascot Records here in, uh, in Holland and Rotterdam um, wanted to put my records out in Europe. And, uh, and so we did it and did some touring as well. Um, so. I just need sometimes someone to call me and say, we want to put your record out and put you on tour. And, and that's all it takes. Yeah, so, so, so you don't write every day for yourself? And oh yeah, you, constantly. Constantly, but you don't need, to, uh, you don't feel the urge to record and to release it or? No, I, well, con yeah, I do constantly. I'm, I'm, I'm always working on somebody's music. Uh, somebody's it, music. But I mean, and my own. And uh, I mean, I just did a single with, with uh, Twiggy Ramirez, with Jordy White for our Goon Moon project. Yeah. Just finished a single a couple of weeks ago. And uh, yeah, like there's always something cooking on the side, you know? And uh, I, I work on music every day of my life, yeah. Oh, but I mean, the urge to release it as a master masters of, of reality? Yeah, yeah. Um, good time coming, I think. Uh, there's it's there's an atmosphere right now um, that I think the world's kind of caught up with what we do, in, in a way, and, and and then which means it's time to move on again. But uh, I think it it just feels right now, like they're gonna get it now, and uh, and before they they, they you know a, a lot of people got it and these pockets and really beautiful, dedicated fans for 25 years, meeting them uh, on tour. And it's just, it's really beautiful and, uh, and very humbling. And so, yeah, they're lovely. And, um, but now I feel like the people beyond them can hear it as well. Like... How come, how come? The, the, the time of man, you know? It's, it's, you can't put a finger on it. It's, it's, it's a smell in the air or something, you know what I mean? You just feel it. And, uh, and I'm feeling it right now. Thank you for your time. Good ending. <laughs>